Okay. Yes. So um, I'm here to uh, just report on uh, the general idea using the magnetic scalar potential to design coils. And so in, in the, the traditional design you could say is that you had some sort of coil you want, you, some sort of field you want, and some sort of location where you have to put your coil. And uh, so what, what you would normally do is just take all the requirements and come up with some kind of winding, uh, just guess at some winding of coil, uh, calculate the fields using Bios of Art or using um, finite element or whatever technique you use. And then you just have to say, is the coil okay? If not, you would make tweaks to it and just keep going back and forth until you got a coil that was what you wanted. And I'm going to report on a streamlined design where instead uh, you break up your requirements into two different steps. One is your, your field requirements, say. Um, and so you, you can calculate, say, the, the field you could have if you know, a genie came and gave you three wishes and said, well, what, what do you want? And without worrying about geometric constraints or where to put the coils. And then as a second step, you can add in your geometric coils. Where do you want to put your coils? And instead of calculating the field, actually calculate what the windings should look like. And in that case, the only le thing left to do then is just to validate your choice. So, so go back to the traditional BOS of art calculations just to make sure that what you calculated for your windings was correct. Okay, and um, so let's start with just a generic problem. And this is, uh, this uh, technique really applies to a very specific type of problems where you have a small precise fields, for instance, for spin precession or, or spin transport. And in this case, you have a target region where you, you know exactly what you want for the field. Uh, it could be a uniform field or some sort of quadrupole gradients or, uh, but you get to choose exactly what that, that shape looks like. But you should know, um, you should have a, know the exact value everywhere in the region so you can, uh, so you know the flux coming in everywhere around the boundary. Now the problem with this is that, or I should say not the problem, but in order to get that, you're gonna to have to take these field lines and continue them around because of uh, the divergence list of the B field. And so what you need is uh, another return region where, where the field lines can circle around. Uh, and that gives you a hermetic, tar a hermetic magnet that has no field lines outside of this green volume and therefore it won't interact with other magnetic materials. Okay, um, so we'll call the first region the target and the second region the return. And this is, uh, this is the net coil we want to make. And we already know the field in the inside, but we don't know the field on the outside. Okay. Um, so in order to uh, facilitate things, um, we're, we're better off to, um, instead of thinking about one boundary region between the target and the return, we're better off to uh, separate it and think about almost like a no man's land in between so that we have, um, still we have two regions with a transition region in between that's very thin that we can essentially ignore. But what this does is it gives you two boundaries between the regions, one boundary associated with each region. So we have an inner boundary for the inner region and outer boundary for the outer region. The, the requirement for this transition region is that the lines of flux will, will be perpendicular to both surfaces going through this region here. And we'll see how that's useful in just a minute. So, um, once you have uh, the field lines, we can apply uh, Ampere's law to, um, to ca especially at the boundary, to calculate the, the windings. And since, um, well, uh, you can integrate del cross H equals J to get the integral form of Ampere's law, um, or you can uh, just apply the boundary conditions in the normal Amperian loop way. And essentially that becomes turning your, your gradient or your nabla curl into a delta of n hat cross, or just delta n hat, and then your, your currents, uh, volume currents turn into surface currents. Um, and so this is what you get for your, uh, your boundary condition, which if you know the fields on both sides, that will tell you, uh, you can use those to solve for your winding current density k. Okay, 
uh, if we uh, now if we go from fields to potentials, uh, of course, if the curl of H is zero inside the region, uh, then we can express it as the gradient of a scalar potential. And I'll always do this with the H field since H is what is related to the currents from del cross H equals J. Okay, um, then the second condition is, well, del dot mu H equals zero. And so from that, you can get a Laplace's equation, or it could be del dot del, or del dot mu del U equals zero if there's magnetic materials. Um, and if we go back at, at the, the boundary condition again, uh, now I've replaced the H's with the gradient of U. Uh, the N hat cross gives the transverse or the tangential component of it. And uh, since that the fields are in the direction of the boundary, we can integrate them or we can use the, the fundamental theorem of vector calculus and just get um, the integral of the gradient is just the change in u equals i. Okay, so if we look at that, um, what, it, what we get then on the boundary is we get uh, basically the change of u between any two points, say this point and this point, is equal to uh, the difference between, I should say, the difference between the delta u on one side of the surface and on the other side of the surface gives you um, the total current that's enclosed in between. Now this is why we uh, chose a transition region that had the field lines uh, perpendicular because on that side you can see that the u, the equal potentials, are going to be parallel to the surface and we can arbitrarily set u equal to zero on one side. Okay, and that gives us a physical interpretation of the magnetic scalar potential. Uh, what we just said is that the change in potential from one, one point to another on this inner surface is equal to the amount of current that flows in between there. Uh, here's another picture of the same thing. Uh, you can see the equal potential surfaces here, and each surface is a plane, and where that plane intersects this wall here, uh, you'll have a wire that flows along there. And you can either flow, uh, so if you divide your equal potentials, each one is where U is separated by I, then that means that you're gonna have current I flowing in between each ribbon on the surface here. Uh, and you can either put the current in ribbons, like a three-dimensional printed circuit board, or you can uh, wind it with wires and just put one wire at each equal potential contour and put I right through, like put all your current right in that one spot. Okay, so this uh, physical representation of the, of the magnetic scalar potential tells you how to wind the coils if you just solve for the, the potential in the regions where you don't know the field yet. So I just want to uh, do one uh, a small uh, kind of pictorial representation of, of the fields to see uh, what this means kind of intuitively. Um, and I'm going to base it on Gauss's law where we all know that a charge is the source of an electric line of flux. And that's, that's the, the geometry of Gauss's law. The same geometry applies to uh, magnetic fields except it's a twisted symmetry because now instead of point charges, we have line currents. And instead of D lines of flux, we have H equal potentials of H, okay? And so every, instead of a dot putting out a line, we have a line putting out a half sheet. And those half sheets uh, spread out into space give us the, the potential that we can take the gradients to calculate the magnetic field. Uh, I'd like to note that, um, of course, going around the circle, uh, you're going to have a discontinuity. And so that's why, of course, that we normally don't think about the magnetic scalar potentials because it's not continuous going around uh, current loops. Um, uh, of course, the other side of the equations is that um, the normal electric potential, which you can represent as potential surfaces, are closed. Um, if we want to take the same thing from magnetic fields, we have to look at not the surfaces, but the lines. And in this case, our magnetic field lines are solenoidal. Okay, and just a, a couple of examples of how this applies. Uh, you could think of a solenoid that has vertical field and the perpendicular potentials will be disks. So to wind the solenoid, you have to put a ring of current around each disk and that's the normal solenoid. Uh, if you want a solenoid with um, 
well, if you look in this example here, the field lines aren't just inside, but they're also outside. And that be, that's an important point, is you have to um, form potentials everywhere where the field lines are. And each of those potentials has its own boundary that you have to wind, both in the region you care about plus in the return region. Okay, and so as you can see, you get um, kind of like shower cap surfaces on the outside for the for the fringe and the return and if you wind those you'll see that you get a higher current density on the end caps due to the to, to handle the fringing fields okay um, we all use the cosine theta a lot and um, this one's particularly nice to analyze in terms of the scalar potential because if you have a constant field on the inside um, then your equal potentials are just going to be these vertical sheets, uh, flat planes, and therefore you wind them around the contours of these planes. And since the planes are equally spaced in x, uh, the windings are equally spaced in rho cos phi. And that's why they're called cos theta coils. Okay, so that then is the way that you use this uh, technique to solve for general coils. You choose the potential you know in the target, and the flux that's going out of the target forms the, the Neumann conditions for a boundary value problem with the Laplace equation in the return, where the outer surface of the return, you specify zero flux of boundary conditions. Once you've solved for the, equi the potential outside, uh, you slice up the volumes both on the, on the target and return regions with equally spaced potentials. And now you know how to wind the coil. You just wind wires around each equal potential, both inside and outside. Okay, I'm just uh, gonna show you a few examples. Uh, here's an example of a, um, a cosine theta coil in a square return region. Uh, this, this is the potential on the inside. And using those flex boundary conditions, you um, you get this for the solution to the potential on the outside. The actual magnetic field lines are going up and then around. Uh, so if you, yeah, if you draw the field lines, they're perpendicular to the potential surfaces. So you can see as they exit here, they will uh, flow downhill uh, all the way around and back around to the other side. And you can also see that on this surface here, since the potentials uh, are perpendicular to the surface that the field lines are going to stay inside the region and not escape. Okay, here's an example um, developed to create a very a uniform uh, magnetic field in four different regions. And the reason is um, the purpose of this coil was to measure the magnetic field as, as a very sensitive measurement of the actual current flowing through the coil so that it can be used to regulate the current in, in the PSI EDM experiment. And because of that, we don't want our measurements to be influenced by outside fields. And so if what we want is if there's a field, say, flowing in the X direction, that the results from these two magnetometers one will be a little bit larger, but it'll be canceled by the one that's a little bit smaller. So we can do that in uh, two different directions. In the third direction, we'll need just a lot of shielding. So what we want is a very uniform field that, that basically switches by 90 degrees in each case. And for this one, you don't even have to solve a, a Laplace equation because you know the potential, you know the field in each region, and the coil geometry is designed so that the lines of flux are continuous. The lines of flux will just be squares of different side length here. And so all you do is you take that equal potential, or you take those planar equal potentials and wrap wires around them. And what you get are a bunch of square coils uh, stacked up in the direction, or I say perpendicular to the direction of the field in each region, this way, this way, here, and here. And uh, um, Peter Koss uh, uh, built this coil, designed it and built it um, at Leuven. And you can see uh, he built it with a printed circuit board and the current uh, travels up the sides uh, 
along the top towards the center. When it gets here, there's a cross of printed circuit boards and it flows down the printed circuit board until it gets to the other end and flows back. Uh, the crossover, the winding crossovers happen along each of these planes here, where in one direction, the current flows from, say, a left coil to a right coil. On the other side, it flows in the opposite direction so that to a large degree, the, the two windings cancel out. And this plot here just shows uh, the, the non-uniformity. So this is H minus the, the, the constant field. Uh, and you can see that the uniformity is um, at the worst 10 to the minus four. And in, in the 10 to the minus five region in the center where the measurements are being made. In, ver in a very small coil, it's about one foot across. Um, here's a, the, what you get for a double cosine theta coil with two cylinders. Uh, of course, you see the, the uniform field with just planar windings on the inside. Uh, this is the solution to Laplace's equation in cylindrical coordinates. And uh, same thing, you get a flux return that flows around the outside. In each of these cases, uh, on the inside, you've got a cosine theta coil. There's another cosine theta coil for the inside of the return, and yet another one for the outside of the return. Uh, and <clears throat> um, but what the potential, so you can get that just uh, from, that, that's easy to get, but what the scalar potential gives you is what the windings look like on the two end caps. And where, where you start with an infinitely long coil with, with Z symmetry, uh, what you can do is you can think of this as just taking a long roll and slicing it at both ends. And the, the boundary conditions, um, or you can see when you slice it, your equipotentials uh, show you where to return the wires from, say, the inside back to the outside along here or from this inside winding here along the front face back to the outside winding. And so what this does is it restores, it keeps the, the, the Z symmetry of the field lines inside and you can have a, a almost perfect cosine theta coil even if it's a finite length. Okay, and that was used by uh, Chris Hayes at Tennessee to design uh, a, a radio, radio frequency spoon flipper uh, with NMR. So neutrons would come through this face right here through a, a current sheet uh, of, aluminum, of aluminum wires. Inside, there's an RF field that's almost perfectly um, left to right. And that even works for um, radio frequency fields. And that field will, will flip a neutron that's either polarized in the up, down direction or in the forward, backward direction, a longitudinal polarized neutron. And the actual coil was built, uh, the inside was machined. The outside was uh, 3D printed. A uh, design was just sent to a company and they, they came back with, uh, I think it was about $5,000 with uh, the coil that had exactly the right grooves to wind this. And the results were very good. Uh, we found, um, using not non-adiabatic, but just a, um, a resonant spin flipper, we were able to get 99.7% polarization. And that was just because we didn't tune it exactly for every wavelength. Uh, this is just a close-up of what the windings look like. And finally, uh, or for another coil, this is also a, a cosine theta coil. Um, the difference is that it doesn't have wires in the front and back because we wanted to um, allow wires through it. And so what you can do is um, take, uh, normally the, the wires from the inside loop that would go down, we could combine them with the wires from the inside moving up into a single current by basically adding an end cap to compensate for the differences. Uh, and it's just an interesting mathematical tidbit. If you do that, um, the windings that go from the inside to the outside form perfect circles. Uh, you can see, for example, this one here, and every circle passes right through the center of the original coil. And so this coil is actually very simple to construct in Inventor, for instance. You just create your two cylinders and you slice them equally in X, put a, put a groove at each X coordinate on the outside, and then you get an X coordinate so for a to connect between the inside and outside grooves, you um, just take a point on one of the grooves here, a point in the center, and the corresponding one on the bottom, and draw a circle through this 
through those three points, and that connects your inside to your outside roofs. Uh, here's a coil that uh, Gilles Canner and I designed for PSI. We didn't end up using it, but it's a self-cancellation coil in a three meter volume. And without um, this, this design doesn't include the small um, imperfections in wire placement. But what you can do is you can take um, the inside part of the coil, you can solve it first as a 2D problem and solve for the positions of each of the wires that minimizes um, different magnetic moments. In our case, we did up to, I think, M equals 15 or 17. Just by uh, optimizing or solving a, a minimization problem for the, the positions of the inner wires, uh, this is a self-cancellation coil, so we also added the constraint that the field along all of these X's here along the boundary should be zero where the magnetic shielding is. And in order to satisfy both of those bound those conditions, we had um, two, two layers of coils. And I should point out that the, the first solution, of course, would just be a normal um, magnetic uh, boundary value problem where you have a, a uniform vertical field on the, uh, sorry, horizontal field on the inside. And this is your flux return here. Uh, but then uh, you take those contours and you, you can fine tune them to account for discretization effects. Um, once you've done that, you have a bunch of wires that have, uh, you know, the potential from a wire is just I phi, or phi, I should say, uh, times I over two pi. Uh, so once you've calculated the, the field everywhere inside, you can use just add up all the potentials due to all the wires, putting the branch cut along the surfaces that the wires are along so that you get uniform fields in each separate region here. And when you do that, and you look at the contours of the potential, you get these um, slightly curvy um, wires here that account for the discrete positions of the wires along the coil. And the good thing is that using this technique, uh, we were able to get um, 10 to the minus 6 a uniformity in a, 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 large, a, a region that was essentially half of the diameter of the whole coil. Not accounting for um, you know, just, just real construction effects like where the wire is. Uh, here's an ex a picture of what the whole coil looks like after you um, combine both the, the longitudinal windings and the, the end cap windings. And finally, I want to uh, show uh, another spin flipper coil. This was an adiabatic spin flipper from Chelsea Hendris at University of Michigan for the NAB experiment. This time the coil, we didn't want a uniform field. We need a, a gradient field for, for the, to, uh, to pass over the resonance region. So you can see that the, where the field is largest on the inside, um, there's the highest winding density. Uh, and the field tapers as you go downstream. Of course, it has to taper in both directions. Uh, and the, the weird uh, kind of side shape of the coils is like this is because on the there's no outside layer. In this case, the outside um, uh, return region is the entire room. And so this one set of coils um, had to do all of the work. Okay, uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, you're fine. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more sections. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the model, uh, what happens when you actually re make real coils. And then uh, in the last section, I want to talk about some, some brand new results uh, about um, a better way to wind these coils that uh, accounts for when you go from one, one equal potential to the next. So first of all, for the reality, um, we don't have continuous surface currents. We have wires. And so that will uh, cause uh, problems. Uh, of course, we have to uh, connect the current from each equipotential contour to the next, and that will cause um, some perturbations, not to mention just um, physical limitations and just wire misplacement. So let's look at, first of all, uh, turning a current sheet of unit current density into a wire and look at how the field um, varies as you do that. So if you look at your surface current density, it's a bunch of delta functions. Uh, each delta function has a Fourier expansion um, where the dominant term will be, of course, the first, the first uh, 
order cosine or the fundamental frequency. Um, and you can turn that, as a boundary condition, you can turn that into a, a solution of Laplace's equation. And of course, um, if you have an imaginary frequency on one side in, on x, you need an exponential frequency in the other direction, uh, so that case, the sum of k squared equals zero. And so that will uh, turn your cosine, uh, your, your sinusoidal um, current density in the first order to an exponential dense, uh, distribution in the z direction. And so this is a remarkable uh, fact that if your wire spacing is d, the, the field dies off as d over 2 pi, it'll die off uh, to 1 third. And so in, in about four of those, you're down to um, way less than the percent. Uh, actually, yeah, in, uh, in 4D, you're down to a 3 10 to the minus 6. Okay, the, the only thing to worry about is, in, for example, in cosine theta coils, while you have a very uniform spacing in where the largest field is, at where the field lines come in and return back, uh, there um, where cosine theta equals zero, you, you get large gaps between the coil. And now the, the, this approximation breaks down, and essentially you have um, just two wires, which would be a, a dipole, or if you combine the other two, you get a quadrupole. But you get, um, in this case, you can get a very large dipole field that, that cuts in from where, where you have very small windings. Now, um, of course, you can improve it much by, by optimizing the exact values you use for the equipotentials. So you don't have to do them exactly spaced by i, but you can, uh, you can uh, choose values that are, that are close, but not exactly that, to, um, to optimize these dipoles uh, as small as possible. OK, so next, uh, so say you've got a sphere or a cylinder. And these are your equal potentials. At some point, you have to have the wire cross from one to the other. And so what you can do is you can just take a region here and where the wire would have gone straight through, uh, pump it up. Uh, if you start with wire here, you're going to end up with your wire out here. And so you have to come back down. And when you do that, since, since uh, you can think of the wires going from left to or the these diagonal wires as a wire left to right, plus a wire going up. And so the net effect you have is your original equipotential windings, what you want, plus one wire coming up and another wire coming down that's not exactly in the same place unless you can weave it in and, in and out of the other one. And that will give you a long, skinny dipole loop that will give you fields that die as d over r squared. OK, so finally, I want to um, talk about some uh, I think a brilliant idea that uh, that Dr. Straley um, came up with that's how to build how to incorporate the the solenoidal or helical windings straight into the solution of the scalar potential, and what that allows you to do is come up with um, what first grants what looks like a winding that's going to give you really twisted field lines, um, even though you get a nice simple, smooth path for winding it, it looks like it's going to give you terrible field lines inside because everything's kind of helical and twisted. But in reality, you actually get um, the exact same perfect fields. It's just that it becomes much simpler to wind and has much less um, errors due to the counter winding that you need to, um, to cross over and then wind back. So I'm going to attempt to uh, explain this uh, um, and we'll, we'll kind of build it up in a couple of steps. So I think the first thing to note is that, um, OK, for a solenoid, um, you can think of uh, a long solenoid, uh, like I just said, as a bunch of ring currents where you have equally or separately uh, disks with the, with the circle around the disk carrying each one current. Uh, you can think of that plus a, uh, a net current of I flowing down the center of the solenoid. Okay, And so uh, you have this axial winding that's, um, that, that as a straight wire will just give you a field of I over 2 pi, 
row. Um, or you can think of that as a potential as this phi potential that we talked about before. And that phi potential has the branch cut where phi goes from zero to two pi. And that discontinuity you can see is the discontinuity of i, which is the same i that each circle along the solenoid has. Okay, and that's actually, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. And the reason is if you add this potential that has a discontinuity every at uh, i as you go once around, if you add that to a potential where going from one disk to the other it also has a discontinuity in i, what you end up with is a helix that winds smoothly from one disk to another and, and has no, uh, and all the discontinuities are right at the wires on the boundary where it doesn't matter. Okay, and the other uh, interesting thing is, and we'll see that in the next slide, that, um, let, let's just go forward. Well, you'll see that the, the currents, uh, or say that the non-uniform field is constrained to outside the solenoid. On the inside of the solenoid, you have, um, uh, of course, the uh, a field flowing in the z-axis down the sides of a solenoid only gives you the, the, the circular or axial field on the outside, not on the inside. So you still end up with a perfect field on the inside. Uh, let's uh, do one more example here. Um, and this is an example to show that you can get the same effects for a finite volume, not for an infinite solenoid. So in this case, uh, take a, a wire and go straight up the center of a sphere. And then, um, uh, and this has no helical windings at all yet, but if you go straight up the center of the sphere and then you come down uniformly in the theta direction all the way back to where you started, uh, what this gives you is in the center or I should say everywhere inside the field, you just get a, um, the field that, what the field you get for an infinitely straight wire. And <clears throat> what the winding screw as you come around the outside is they, they terminate the, the scalar potential. So what you could think of this is take the, this, this uh, scalar potential that looks like all of the pages of a book if it's kind of spread out. Um, each of those half plane scalar potentials, um, if you just restrict the potential to inside the sphere, um, you can see that the, the, the boundary of each wire will look like, a, like a, a lemon slice. And you'll have current going up and then out the surface of the lemon to the end. And what that does is it restricts the potential inside and the potential outside will be zero. And therefore you'll get the field of, uh, you know, of, a, of an infinite wire inside the sphere and nothing outside the sphere. Okay, we're gonna use that effect not for the inside, but for the outside where the return is. So um, for example, let's wind now a spherical uh, dipole. So this time um, we'll take uh, an infinite wire that goes all the way through like that. Uh, we'll add that with our our disk windings to give us our dipole field. Uh, in, but in addition to that, what we're going to do is we're going to add this previous solution here, but in the opposite direction. So that the wire that's going straight through is canceled by the wire that's going this way. And instead, all of the current goes around the outside. And so what that does is it takes your, your, your toroidal field on the outside and it basically cancels it out on the inside of the sphere here so that you get a very uniform dipole field on the sphere. Uh, and on the outside, you have your, your loops that come back around. Of course, they don't come around to the same field line. They'll be twisted by, the, by this one unit of current flowing through. And so you get kind of a twisted field geometry on the outside. And if you combine both this axial winding plus your, your, your disks, uh, what you end up with is a helix that winds the whole solenoid. So what we have for a winding is a straight wire comes in, it spirals around the sphere, and then keeps coming out here, and that gives you a, a uniform field inside, twisted windings on the outside. Okay, and so this, um, uh, let's just look at this. So this kind of tells us then how to wind the inside with a spiral, 
um, and also to contain all the fields because all you have to do is take one of these and cancel it out by one that's at the outside that has the opposite current going through it. And so what you end up with is a spiral both on this inside surface and on the outside surface and perfect field cancellation out everywhere in between. Uh, the new thing about the solution is that instead of having all your rewind or your, your counter windings and your return uh, circuit coming along the surfaces, we actually have this one wire that goes straight through the, the return region from one point here to a, a point over here. Uh, we do helix over to here, we come way out to here, and then we uh, wind the helix around the outside back to where we started so we can come out with a twisted pair or a coaxial tube. Okay, so that becomes, uh, let, let's uh, see. So, um, so what we're saying is um, starting with the pre previous uh, solution where we, we solved just the equal potentials, um, we're going to add this uh, potential that looks like the form I phi over two pi from a straight wire that has a branch plane, but we're going to restrict that branch plane just to outside the target. So this potential is only in the outer region. And uh, I should point out that uh, we want to, to uh, put the two ends of the wire, or we want the input and output to be at the minimum and the maximum of our previous potential so that, so that we can start from uh, one, on one side of the windings and wind all the way up to the highest winding on the other side. Okay. Um, so so uh, for the prescription, uh, we'll, we'll choose the field um, in, the, in the target region, just like always, and find the corresponding uh, field, solve, solve Laplace's equation for the field in the return. Uh, we can look for the maximum and minimum on, on each of the surfaces. And those are the points where current is either going to come in or out of a surface. Um, and here's a, kind of a way to just put it all together. If you, uh, if you choose for, if you take each of those points where the potential is at a maximum or a minimum, uh, you can choose a, a wiring diagram that kind of looks like this. So uh, if this is, if you're, equal potential on the outside, kind of, uh, here's the highest equal potential. Uh, start with the wire that starts here. Take any windy path to the point on the inside where the, where the first potential starts. Uh, keep that wire going all the way to another point here. Um, that's just conceptually at this point. Uh, so, and then from here, uh, take that wire to go from this maximum out to this minimum up here. Okay, and then you can um, complete that wire. So complete it in here and out here to form a complete circuit. Uh, this is the this is the circuit that's going to generate our toroidal windings that will, or I should say, our axial windings that give us our crossover and will generate the helix out of the original winding potential. And so, uh, oops, so. Um, now you can, uh, to calculate the field due to this um, winding circuit here, uh, we can just use the magnetic scalar potential uh, where this is our branch cut. And for example, in simple cases, this circuit could just be a, a straight long wire. Uh, so that gives us our, our winding potential, our circuit, U circuit, our winding potential. Um, and then we can, Go back and solve and uh, resolve the boundary condition on the outside um, for a potential which satisfies slightly modified Neumann conditions, because this potential here uh, will have can have places where its field is not tangent to the to the surfaces, but you can have flux generated by this field here that we don't want. We have to um, create a new Neumann boundary condition that cancels out or that has the ne negative flux incorporated into the boundary conditions. Instead of just zero, it has to cancel out the flux due to this one. So uh, once you go back and solve for your, your scalar potential on the, on the, on the return region, um, we can uh, add that to 
the circuit potential. So here's our regular solution now, our new regular solution. Add to that the circuit, you get a helical winding return circuit. And this, this winding circuit will give you a, a, a helix on the outside, but also if you combine the two inside layers into a single layer, it will also give you a helix there. And so what you end up with is a singly wound coil that has very smooth helical windings, but still has exactly the same um, properties of the, the simplistic, um, just following the contours and then crossing over from one to the next. Okay, I believe that's everything. Um, I just, in, in the end, or, uh, oops. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you very much. And any questions? Uh, I have a question, um, Chris. Uh, have you implemented this helical winding? So you, do you have any um, uh, like model that uh, maybe... No, it's hot off the press. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. This idea, yeah. this idea is all of a week old. <laughs> it's the pressure of the workshop coming at us. We had to have an idea. <laughs> it's it's been motivation to try and get this paper, the first paper out. And I should mention that it's it'll hit the archive uh, sometime this week, and Great. then hopefully the second paper is soon to follow. Wonderful. That's that's super exciting. Thank thank you, Chris. Um,